Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've been asked to talk to, uh, talk to you for just a few minutes just to introduce Chagos and the history of it and where we've got to so far. You all know it's in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Some of you may not quite appreciate how large it is. The whole MPA, if you look at the map on the left there, the green there are the reefs, which are 60,000 square kilometers. The islands are only a very, very few. They're all small, like the ones on the right. But the EEZ of the area would come out to about there, all the way around. It is a huge area um, of, of the world. Now, I first went out there in 1975. Um, and at that time, the reefs of Chagos, they were brilliant, but they were not much different to reefs in a lot of the rest of the ocean. Since then, we have had what people have called the decades of destruction. In overpopulated areas of the Indian Ocean, which is most of it, um, there's been a catastrophic deterioration in marine resources, not just the reefs, but mangroves, seagrass beds, all the things that give you fish and so on like that, uh, everywhere else. But Chagos has remained uh, in as near a pristine state as anywhere. And I shall mention one or two examples where the Chagos Archipelago sets so many world records. One of them is um, in the seamounts. There are about 300 seamounts in Chagos. This graphic shows you the abyssal plain, abyssal trench, and all the seamounts there. Um, the international fishing fleets around the world just scrape them clear. They take a millennium to recover once that's happened. It's a one-way sort of ticket, at least in terms of human lifetimes. And they move on to the next one. The earth will run out, or the oceans are going to run out of these in not too long, and then that'll be interesting. But these in Chagos are also protected because of the 200 nautical mile ring of protection that is around this particular um, archipelago. Now, um, I've been fortunate enough to have been asked to organize quite a few expeditions there uh, since that time. I often bang on strongly about how wonderful the place is because I also have the fortune or misfortune to work in a lot of other countries, some of the really destroyed ones of the world, uh, which is most of it. And I often wonder whether I'm sort of banging on a bit absurdly about things, but it's always very nice when I take out new scientists of international calibre who surface from their first dive and say all the different kind of variations of wow that you can imagine. And I know that I'm on the right track and I'm not exaggerating um, too much. At the bottom of this picture was just the logos of Britain's main leading um, NGOs and science societies who we got together. All the scientists have written about 250 uh, papers in the professional sort of literature on the place, showing all the things which I'm, I hope to mention in a minute or, or two. And at the bottom there was their logos. There's been a few changes since then. We've had a few more join it, for example, like that. And I know the representatives of a bunch of them are, are here today, are the leading NGOs um, and the science societies of Britain. We formed this organization called the Chagos Environment Network, who's, and, and it was formed to pressure, if that's the right word, uh, the Foreign Office, into creating what had now become recognized as being an exceptional and extraordinary and very rare example of how the world used to be. And um, I must say, we were pushing at an open door with the government because they had accepted all this. They have advisors too, other than us. Um, and it was, as I said, an open door. And they declared it in three years ago as a no-take no marine protected area. Um, the main change there was they also banned the tuna fishing as well. It was to be a refuge for that um, also. Now, why an MPA? A lot of people think they can manage marine ecosystems. It's absurd. It is the ultimate in hubris. We can't manage it. We don't even understand them properly. All we can do is to manage humans' impacts on them and say, don't mess it up. Don't dump sewage on it. Don't do coastal engineering works and things like that. Leave it alone, and it will stay in good condition. And we can see that has happened. Um, the way to do it is to create a marine protected area where these activities don't take place and are prohibited. It's not a, 
it isn't a recipe for the whole world. You can't do that next to Dar es Salaam and places like that. People are starving. More people die from hunger in the world now, under fives, than from any other source. Hunger exacerbates all the diseases for a start. We need some areas, we maintained, um, to show that the place was in good condition, worth protecting, and it would be a legacy site for the Indian Ocean and the world as a whole. Um, one atoll in it is Diego Garcia, which has a military base and is the reason for the creation of Biot in the first place. One program we have undertaken is the chemical analysis of pollution for, for uh, well, the water, the sewage, and organisms as well. Shago says this is one of the world records we've got. It is the cleanest place in the world. Um, it used to be the deep water in the Sargasso, and Antarctica was. But this is cleaner. And that is quite a remarkable um, feat, I think. Now, on land, the story is not so happy. Um, the coconut plantations, as happened all around the world, they uh, took over tropical islands 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And the islands were packed with birds and plants and things like that, Indian Ocean hardwood, native species. Um, and they were felled on all the larger islands, and they were converted into coconut plantation. So they were destroyed. The results are remarkable. You can go onto an island like this. The small islands, I should say, which were too small to be economic, were left. And they are extraordinary. The noise on an island like this, for all from 50,000 turns, which are nesting, you can hardly hear yourself think, let us speak. You go onto an island which was planted, it's deathly quiet. The contrast is remarkable, and one of the plans we have is to try to restore one, to start with, we have the funding for that, uh, but more islands from the condition which they're in after the coconut plantation. You know, there's no blame attached. Um, the whole world was sort of doing this. Um, restore that with the input from Q for the plants and RSPB for the birds and other science societies as well. Restore them to a condition, hopefully like that, where you can't walk through them. We don't allow people to walk through the islands because they would tread on eggs of the ground nesters. They would go through the shearwater burrows and crush it. We just don't allow it. it. These are, as one example, there are 10 internationally important bird areas in these small islands that are left. 10. Um, we um, have a number of records, as I keep saying. Um, the coconut crab is very edible, apparently. And in all islands where there are people, they have been extirpated sometimes completely. They are extinct all around the world on most islands, or you might find one or two if you looked hard enough. Here, there's been no eating of them for 40 years now, and their densities are an average of 300 per hectare, peak densities of 600 per hectare. No one knew they could live in that sort of density. The turtles as well. Well, um, when we first went there, there were as many turtles as were exported every year 100 years ago. I was told that we had to be patient to see their recovery because they have to get to 30 years old before they can breed. Now it's happening, and before it would be a miracle to see a turtle. It would be great excitement if we saw one. The greens which were eaten and hawksbills which were made into essential things like handbag clasps and things like that. Um, now. Um, you see lots of them on every dive. They are coming back, and there are some extraordinary nurseries. Some um, have, have, have actually had satellite uh, uh, tags on their shells. Within two or three months, they were already on the coast of Kenya and Oman and things like that. Leading me to my final point, which is that Chagos is, is a stepping stone in the east-west flow of species. It is essential to the biodiversity of the Indian Ocean. It is essential to... Um, if you like, the connectivity. It is, it is a reservoir of species, but it is also a source of larvae for all the depauperate and mangled places that you see if you do, um, if you work on the Yemen coast right down to South Africa, uh, like that. And the genetics work is a big part of the program that we're doing now, um, showing the linkages and the key hub, if you like, that Chagos happens to be um, in the Indian Ocean. 
I think I'll leave it there. I'm happy to answer questions. There's an awful lot I can rabbit on about. I love the place. Uh, but uh, okay, let's go and have a drink. Now.